We have been starting here in the book of, of Matthew, talking about King Jesus. Uh, today we're talking about the first students that he had, uh, among other things. I don't know if, if you're acquainted with, with AA. Some of you, I'm sure, are. I'm looking at people. Uh, anyway, at, at AA meetings, they don't use last names. Uh, they try to keep it fairly anonymous. They use their first name and their, and their last initial. And this is a story about a guy named Craig. Craig um, was an alcoholic. His alcoholism had caused him to lose his job. Uh, his family was destroyed. He was at the end of his uh, rope, basically. And um, he, was, he had a job. But even his job did not help him because he worked in a grocery store and the grocery store served, sell, sold alcohol. So every time he, you know, took somebody's bags to, to their car, every time he had to walk through, every time he had to sweep a floor, it, it just ate at him that there was all this alcohol present. And finally he, he came to the end of his rope and he went to church. He discovers God again, he turns his life over and he says, you know, God, I, I have just got to get out of this grocery store and I am, I am going to give up my job. And he went and applied at a, at a sheet metal uh, factory that was a couple blocks from the church. Uh, you know, he didn't have to, you know, walk and drive anywhere, which he couldn't do by that time. And, and so he applied there and he said, Lord, please give me this job. And the Lord answers, gives him a job at the sheet metal factory. He is so grateful, he takes his first paycheck, the whole thing, and just takes it down to the church and signs it all over and says, here, fine, great. Now, I'm not suggesting you do that, okay? What I am suggesting that you do is live sacrificially. Our lives need to be a sacrifice to God. And every part of our life needs to be sacrificed to God. Uh, I, I go and sell Bibles at a Bible bookstore on Saturdays sometimes. And I was there yesterday. And this lady comes in and she says, Oh, I have this friend. Uh, she is, she is uh, dying of cancer. She's got a, they've told her she has a couple years to live. And I want to buy her a Bible. And I'm going, Oh, this is a good thing. It's a great thing. And she says, all right, uh, I don't know which Bible to buy. And I said, well, I would suggest this one. And uh, she says, well, I'm going to call my pastor. That's a good thing, too. Uh, so she calls her pastor, and her pastor says, oh, this is the kind of Bible you need to buy. And uh, it was different than the Bible I suggested, but he's wrong and I'm right. Uh, <laughs> don't go to that church. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so... so then I, I bring the Bible to her that her pastor suggested, and, and she's looking at that. And then she says, no, I don't want to buy that one, and I don't want to buy the one you suggested. I want to buy this one over here. It had nothing to do with cancer. It had nothing to do with her, her, her friend's need. And then she says, she says, I can't afford that one because that one's too expensive. And then she bought two Bibles for herself, a Bible cover and another thing. I don't know what that was. What do you mean you don't, it's too expensive, you don't have the money? Are you just being selfish or just not, or clueless? Which one is this? And I, I'm thinking, you know, she is buying Bibles for herself instead of buying this Bible that would really help her friend who's dying of cancer. She, I don't think, was living sacrificially. It was just hard to watch. And I'm going, well, you know, God bless you anyway. And she, and she bought what she wanted. God wants us to live sacrificially. He doesn't want you to throw yourself on a grenade necessarily unless somebody throws a grenade in here. And then he, God definitely wants you, and I'm not saying who, <laughs> to throw yourself on the grenade. Okay? But God wants us to live sacrificially. There are three little stories here that we have uh, working up to as pre preparation for uh, the ministry of the Messiah. Uh, they're actually a transition kinds of stories because uh, they also 
get into Jesus preaching and teaching, which are part of his ministry. So they are transitioning us into that first great sermon that Jesus preaches in the book of Matthew. The first story tells us about Jesus' decision to resettle in Capernaum. You know, he has been working in the south, he's been working in Judah, and now he decides that he needs to go up to Capernaum and settle there. This fulfills God's plan uh, for a Gentile mission as well as a Jewish one. God wants people to go everywhere in this world and preach the gospel. And so it fulfills that part of his plan, starts that ball rolling. The second story tells us about uh, Jesus' first students. Um, and that reminds us that we're all involved in the ministry of Jesus. Matthew pushes that story up uh, to the beginning to remind us that from the very beginning, Jesus is involving us in, in uh, helping out in this world, in the ministry that we have. And then the last story begins the teaching and the preaching and the healing and the spread of these things everywhere. Uh, Matthew points out, he, he has already pointed out several times in his letter, in his book so far, that the gospel is going to go out into the entire world. And Matthew ends his book by the gospel going out into the entire world. And he just keeps reminding us that the gospel has to go out. It has to permeate every part of this planet. In these first verses in 12 through 17, Jesus begins his ministry, he transitions into his ministry. And actually, uh, John chapters 1, verse 1 through 5 tells us that Jesus has already been ministering. He has been ministering in the south. But Matthew just kind of skips that. Uh, he joins the story slightly later in the, in the process. And I think he wants to, to he does this for various reasons. Uh, he describes the launch point as the Baptist attack. You can, I don't know if you can see it or not, but John is being led away there uh, into captivity. I think Matthew does this because he wants us to, to tie in Jesus' ministry with John's death. He wants us to understand that from the very beginning that ministry has to do with sacrifice, and it may require our entire life. John had an extended ministry before he was arrested, and so does Jesus. But everything leads to that arrest. Everything leads to that death. And he is telling us that everything is going to lead to our, our need for sacrifice as well. Matthew is reminding us that these are the goals of John's life and Jesus' life. It's a sacrificial life in this world. Jesus takes John's arrest as a signal to move back to Galilee. Things were getting a little hot. Uh, down in Judah, and so uh, Jesus uh, moves up into, into Galilee, into Capernaum. Galilee was this deep, unfished pool. Where's Spencer? Uh, <laughs> is he out fishing? <laughs> oh, there he's in the back. Okay, I see him. Uh, ready for a fisherman. You know, he is just, you know, people there are just waiting for the gospel to be, to be uh, proclaimed to them. And so Jesus first went home, uh, it says he went to Nazareth, but then he quickly, he moves on to Capernaum. Uh, all of this is, to, is Matthew's way of saying that Jesus is doing what God commands, that God has this world under control. Capernaum was far more central than Nazareth and much better headquarters. Uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, also, several of his disciples were from there. This is a picture of, of Capernaum as it, as it is today, the tourist part of it. This building here is, houses Peter's boat. Uh, they have no idea it was, whether it was Peter's or not. But they, when the waters uh, receded in the Lake of Galilee here in the last 20 years, uh, they discovered a, a boat that had been sunken in the mud uh, from the time of Jesus. Well, you know, the tourist industry said, oh, this is Peter's boat. Uh, it's amazing that it's a boat of any kind and that, you know, frankly, Jesus may have seen it. Peter may have ridden in it. Who knows? Uh, but it, that's in that building there. And they also call this like Peter's house because he lived in Capernaum and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, the scripture quotation tells us that there is a great light dawning, a great day of glorious People coming, people coming to know Christ. They're not glorious people, but it's a glorious day. Matthew is saying that the light was dim in Judah. It was dim in, in Jerusalem. I think he's also implying that the light was dim in Nazareth. They just weren't responsive there to what Jesus had to say. 
Matthew stresses that this is where the tribe of Zebulun was from. Zebulun was from Nazareth. Dakota did a nice job of attempting to say that name. Uh, but kind of, I, most of us would say she missed. They've been dead a long time, and I don't know if you know, they had any clue as to how they say their name. Naphtali uh, was from the people, were the people around Capernaum. And Jesus is heading that direction in line with the plan of God. For the fifth time here in the book of Matthew, Matthew stresses that this is in fulfillment of Scripture, which shows us, with, which Matthew wants to use to show us that God is in control. He has been in control since Isaiah said these words 700 years earlier. God has been in control all that time, and Jesus is fulfilling Scripture because God is in control. Jesus' ministry was in Galilee was, on the one hand, a stumbling block to all of those people in Judah. On the other hand, it was God's will for evangelism. God was working his will in all of these places, trying to get the gospel out so that people could respond. The context of Isaiah chapter 9 is coming judgment, but is also great deliverance. Chapter 8 says, you people in Zebulun and Naphtali, you're the first to go. But he also says in, in, uh, after these verses that unto you a child is born. One of the most amazing promises on the planet. Because we now have a Savior. There is a promise of deliverance. And when Jesus comes and says, Matthew says that he fulfills the scriptures, he's not only warning people that there is judgment, but he is also promising a great deliverance. Zebulun and Naphtali were among the first to go into captivity. Way back in 722, the Assyrians came along. They destroyed the entire northern nation. They took them all the way into captivity. Zebulun and Naphtali were the first to go. They were the first, if, if we want to use cause and effect, which I don't like to do because I talked about it in Sunday school, they were the big sinners. They were the first ones to, to, to leave. But God is saying, even the big sinners can be forgiven. A great light, a great hope was dawning in the land of the shadow of death. Did you notice that phrase? This was the land of the shadow of death. Beth saw something on Facebook. It was this chicken standing out in front of Kentucky Fried. And it said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> These people were in that predicament. Seriously and horribly. But a, a sh light was dawning. Jesus was coming. Matthew changes the word in the prophecy. I don't know if you noticed that either. If you read back in, in, in Isaiah and if you read here in, in Matthew, he changes it. The, a great light is shining brightly to a great light is dawning. He wants us to tell, say that this light is starting. This light is, is beginning to, to uh, shine into this area, into this world. The light is just beginning to shine on the entire world. From that time on, indicates that the preparation is over. The ministry is now here. Jesus has come. He is, from that time, Jesus was starting to minister. He was, he was moving out into the world. He was beginning his public ministry. The major focus of Jesus' ministry is repent. <laughs> I like that when Dakota was reading because she, she punched that word repent. Uh, for the kingdom of heaven is near is near means both has come near and is near. It means it's both already and not yet. This is the time that we live in. We live in the time of the already and the not yet. Already Jesus Christ is here, but he hasn't come back. He is, he is still living in heaven, but someday he will return. And so we live in this transition time between the promises that he has given to us that are ours partially, but not in, our, in, not in their fullness. And we have to deal with that. We have to deal with the fact that we have eternal life, but our bodies will still die, at least for most of us, unless the Lord comes again. One of the major items in finding the Lord's will is to surrender to his leading. I think that's what Matthew is saying right up here at the front of Jesus' ministry. Jesus does what God says, surrendering to his will. We need to let God handle the strategy. Yeah, 
there was opposition in Judah. Yeah, there, there was an opening in Galilee, and they were probably ready to receive the word. And yeah, he might have wanted to just go home. You know, it says he went back to Nazareth to be with his family. But we need to let God move, just like Jesus did. The main issue is God's will. That's why Matthew quotes this prophecy, because everything that Jesus did was in response to God's will. God said, go to Galilee, he went. God says, go to Capernaum, he went. God says, call the disciples, he calls them. He lived according to God's will. He did this because God wanted to let this great light shine into Zebulun and Naphtali, just like he had planned. God's got a plan, and he wants us to participate in that plan. God knows everything, everywhere, every time, in every life. He has a plan. We need to, to participate and go along with that plan. God has the moves all mapped out in your life. He is in control. Now, you can choose to, to fight against that. He's also got that planned out as well. That's your choice. It's an amazing thing that God has, has, is in absolute control and you have absolute free will to do what you want. But God has even moves our free will into his plan. I don't know how that works. And part of God's plan is for each of us to let the gospel reach the world. God wants every one of us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, for most of us, all the world is Tecumseh. Okay, maybe Beatrice... Maybe Cook. Oh, I don't know about Cook. Okay. Uh, no, I don't. God wants the gospel to go into every part of the world. Your part of this job is to go into Tecumseh. You need to call to go to, to Johnson, Johnson just as much as Ellis has needed a call to go to the Sudan. You need a call to both of these places. God may be calling you into full-time ministry like he, he did me. But he may be calling you to be a homemaker. God gives each one of us a call. He has a plan for each one of us to spread the gospel into our part of the world. This has always been part of God's plan, starting back in Genesis in 12, 3, and 15, and 18. And all through the rest of the Old Testament, God has been reaching out into the world. And his plan for us is to reach out into our lives, into our communities. Now, if God calls you to someplace else, Great, go. You know, we want you to be in part of God's plan. But wherever you are, we need to be spreading the gospel. Matthew finishes up the ministry of Jesus on this earth with go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's his plan for us. Whether it's Tecumseh, Nebraska, the world, Sudan, all over the place. And the message we bring to people is repent. Repent, you know, that sounds like something that a guy on the street corner would yell at you. And it is. <laughs> because God wants us to change our hearts, our souls, our minds, our lifestyle, our love, everything. He wants us to align it with Jesus Christ. To be going the same direction as Jesus does. Matthew moves on in, in 14 and 18 to 20 to call the first students. Uh, the first disciples. We tend to think of them as 12 extraordinary people, but they are really 12 ordinary people. And God calls them. They got picked for a very special job. Again, this is God's plan. But he has a special plan for you as well. A plan that only you can do, and Matthew or Peter or, or James could not do. He has a plan for you as well. It is time to include other callers of repentance. You know, Jesus isn't the only one who calls people to repentance. John the Baptist wasn't the only one to call people to repentance. We are calling people to align themselves with Jesus Christ. The disciples represent us. We are the church. They are us and, and we are them. Most of Jesus' ministry centers on preparing those first students. He didn't do a lot of evangelism. He spent most of his time discipling. And we spend a great deal of our time in church discipling, practicing that same kind of ministry. That doesn't excuse us from evangelism. It doesn't excuse us from going into all the world. But we know that we need to train people to do the job that we're doing as well. 
The disciples and us were part of the plan from the beginning. This is why Matthew includes the calling of James and John and Peter and, and Andrew right here at the front. Because he wants us to know that, that having helpers, having fellow callers of repentance, is right here at the beginning. Immediately, Jesus gives them a new ministry, fishing for people. Spencer, I've got a new ministry for you, fishing for people. <laughs> He likes fishing for fish. Uh, and so did Jesus, and so did Peter and, and Andrew and James and John. They all liked fishing for fish, but we've got a new job. Jesus begins marshalling his forces for the greatest catch that he can think of. He is anticipating hundreds and thousands and millions of people coming to know Christ, and Jesus is gathering his army to do that, gathering his fishermen to do that. Students in Israel would choose their rabbi, but Jesus chose his students. Again, Matthew is reminding us that Jesus is in control. He had this kind of authority. You know, it just wasn't random. It just wasn't took whoever he got. He went out and picked people. You have been picked by God to be his fishermen. He calls them to have this radical, immediate response. This is one of the reasons, one of the ways that, that we know what kind of story Matthew is emphasizing, what kind of point he's trying to make, that Jesus has this absolute priority over family and occupation. Jesus first calls Simon and Andrew, uh, and then he calls James and John. The initiative, again, is entirely with Jesus. He says, has said this several times in this passage already. They had met earlier. Well, there's more to this story. John tells us that there's more to this story. Matthew shortens up this story to say our response is come and follow. Our response is to obey immediately. This is what Matthew is pointing out. He could have talked about the time they met earlier when they were both uh, hanging around with John the Baptist. He could have you know, talked about earlier when they met at the marketplace. You know, but he focuses on God called, they responded. The job that Jesus gives them is to be fishers of men. This is a change. Fishermen kill and eat their prey, right? <laughs> this is not what Jesus wants you to do. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of that. Jesus saves the fish from destruction, okay? Yes, eat more chicken. Save the fish from destruction. <laughs> this, is, this is the opposite of what the Old Testament talks about. In the Old Testament, when it talked about being fishers for men, in, in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Habakkuk, they all say that the, the nets are going out, the fish are being caught, and they're going to be destroyed. Jesus says, let's, let's back off on that. Let's change the metaphor. Let's Change the paradigm. We want to become fishers of men to save their little... Fins. What? Fins. fins. That's it. Change the little fins. Save the little fins. Jesus is sending us to save many from a terrible end. I don't know where I got that. I don't know why I used it. The disciples refused to even reel in their fish. They had a, they had a catch going. They, they were out there in the boats. And Jesus says, come. And they left their fish, and they came and became fishers of men. They changed their entire perspective on life, their entire perspective on Scripture. You know, they, they'd been going, let's destroy those people. Now they're going out and saving those people. Jesus calls us to this voluntary surrender to a sacrificial life. God wants us to save our lives by losing it, by giving away everything in our life to Jesus Christ. Matthew is making a point, okay? <laughs> Sorry. The disciples kept their boats. We know this. John tells us. They kept their boats. Okay? Matthew's making a point. The point is that everything in our life needs to be aligned with Jesus Christ. We don't have to give up our jobs. We don't have to divorce our families. We don't have to, to run away to wherever the backside is Swaziland. But he wants us to know that everything has to be aligned with Jesus Christ. Whether you stay here and teach school, whether you, you are a mechanic, whether you work at the prison, everything has to be aligned with Jesus Christ. Whether we are, you're a family man or whether you're not, whether you have brothers and sisters, whether you don't, 
Everything has to be aligned with Jesus Christ. This is the point. You don't have to give those things up necessarily, but you have to surrender them to Jesus and let him work in those situations. Jesus has absolute authority in our lives. That's Matthew's point. Make sure we get that point. They would be gone from their boats for days. They'd follow Jesus for weeks. They'd be gone from their, from their livelihood, from their jobs. They would be gone from, from uh, the life that they knew. Eventually, they would just leave the entire country. God is in charge, and he wants us to know that. Now, some people have been called to stay here. Some people have been called to go there. Some people have been called to leave their homes. Some people haven't. But you have to align, align everything with Jesus Christ. Jesus does the same thing with James and John and adds that they left their families. It's interesting. Zebedee is mentioned twice. It's like, it's like uh, Matthew wants us to make sure that we know who Zebedee is because he's going to say they left Zebedee. They left Zebedee. Here in this picture, there's James, there's John, there's Zebedee. Do you think he was happy about this? You just left me with a boat full of fish. You know? Do you think he was happy about losing his unpaid help? You know? Uh, do you think he was happy about them going off and serving the Lord? No. But, yeah, that's right. But they had to obey. They had to obey. And, and hopefully Zebedee figured that out after a while and... and came to reconcile himself to that. Every relationship has to take a lesser role next to Jesus. Jesus is at the center. Everything else is lesser. Jesus says, goes so far as to say, if you don't hate your family, you don't have any part of me. That it's his way of saying he has to be at the center. He's not saying hate your family. Jesus said lots of stuff about loving your family, obeying your parents, all that kind of good stuff. But he's saying God has to be the center. He has to be the center. In Mark, Jesus calls them immediately. Matthew changes the word order a little bit. He says they responded immediately. In, Ma in Mark, he is emphasizing what Jesus was doing. Matthew emphasizes our response. We have to obey God. We have to put him at the center of our lives. The core of this passage is mission, fishing. Okay? The core of this passage is, is winning people to Christ our mission in life. Jesus called those that he could mold into fishermen. He wants our children to become fishers of men. He wanted our parents to turn us into fishers of men. Our goal in Sunday school is to make people focused on the mission of fishing for men. Awana, VBS, whatever ministries we have, the goal of your family, the goal of your job is to become a fisherman. The potential Jesus sees is the potential to respond. He saw that in them and chose them and they responded. Our, why God picks us is because we respond. Are we willing to surrender control of our life to him? Are we willing to surrender our, life, our lives to him? Are we willing to say, wherever you send me, whether it's, you know, Pawnee City or wherever on the planet, we have to be willing to go. We have to surrender our lives. Too many people think that they know what is best for their lives. Too many people think, oh yeah, I've got it planned out. We're not letting God be the strategist. We're not letting God direct our lives. Jesus creates us. He knows us. He knows what will make us happy. And if he sends us to a God-forsaken place, he knows that this is what's good for us. These people left everything. They left everything because it doesn't matter anymore. You know, why, why drag along all your money when the streets of heaven are paid with gold? You know, he says, leave everything and I will give you so much more. When we come into Christ, we don't give him a tenth of our lives and keep the rest. We give him all of it. All of it. Every part of it. This isn't just the church here the church goes into your homes. The church goes into your jobs. Every part of it needs to be part of what Christ has done. He is the king, and we say, as you wish. Isn't that right? We say, as you wish. That's our job. That was Peter and James's job. This looks different 
for each one of us. Because some of you are called into families, some of you are called to be single, some of you are called to work in jobs, some of you are called not to, some of you are called to be carpenters, some of you are called to, to school teachers, some of you are called to work at the hospital. It, everything looks different. Okay, we're all called to different places. But the job is all to be fishers of men and to be obedient. Everything we hold back from God is just going to hamper us from being happy. Everything we hold back <laughs> will just get in the way of us serving the Lord. Jesus has now fulfilled all righteousness. We read that a couple weeks ago. He has moved to Galilee to fulfill Scripture. He's moving into this job of His. He's brought in followers right at the beginning. Matthew wants us to know that followers are important. Now, in these last verses, He begins His ministry Next week, we get to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. His ministry is words and action, teaching and preaching and healing, ministering to everyone. His strategy is, is to teach, proclaim, heal. Uh, Matthew is preparing for this first great sermon that Jesus is going to, to give us. Galilee was small. It's just 20 miles by 40 miles. It's probably as big as our county or our couple counties. But it had 204 villages and towns. And Jesus said, I'm going to go to every one of them. Now, I'm going to stop at every one. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to one town. And after lunch, I'm going to another town. In the evening, I'm going to stop somewhere else. He only had a little while to do this. You know, but he's going to go and see as many of these villages and towns as he can. Teaching is, it was an exposition of the Old Testament. Jesus loved to teach. He would go into the synagogue on, on the Sabbath and they would say, hey, you got a message for us from the Old Testament? And they say, he said, sure, let me show you Isaiah. Let me tell you about Jeremiah. Let me tell you about Ezekiel. They're all calling you to follow me. The good news is the preaching of the gospel. What the gospel means good news. That's what Jesus does. He preaches us, tells us good news. And he healed all their diseases. This is a now and not yet thing again. Jesus has promised us healing, but maybe not now. It may be coming in the future. It will come in heaven. But sometimes Jesus just flat out heals us. He just flat out fixes us. I've seen it before. And we'll see it again. But most of us are going to grow old and die. And, you know, the bones hurt and the, yeah... But Jesus will heal us. The news about him spread all over Syria. This isn't in modern day Syria. This was their Roman province of Syria. People came from everywhere. They came because he met their needs. They came because they wanted to be touched by, he, by Jesus. Everyone is impacted by Jesus, whether for good or for ill. It's not only the power that impressed these people, but the compassion. He was willing to touch lepers. He was willing to touch people who had demons. He was willing to touch people who, that society just wanted to ignore. He had this compassion in him. Our question is, does our vision include the entire world? That means, does it include your community? Does that include your home? You're, that, you're the missionary there. But does it include the entire world? And finally... Does it encompass every need? Matthew lists a whole bunch of them. and says Jesus was willing to fix all of those kinds of people. He starts off with their sin, but he wants to help them in all their lives. Does our ministry encompass all of those? At the end of World War II, they started bombing in, in the Balkan states, Yugoslavia and those places, trying to cut off Hitler's oil supply so that they could end the war sooner. And, and the bombers had to fly an immense distance, and the whole way they were being shot at and, and by anti-aircraft guns or, or the planes or whatever. And as they were flying over the, over the Balkans, a lot of them got shot down. The Nazis were all over the place. They had military camps everywhere. But the Slavs, the people that were living in the Balkan hills, they knew the country. They knew the forests. They knew the trails. They knew the clearings. And they would go out every night and they would look for planes that had been shot down. And they, in an operation called Operation Halyard, 
They went and found these people, and they found hundreds. By the end of this operation, 500 airmen were rescued because these people knew what the Nazis didn't. They knew the trails. They knew their hills. They knew their forests. And they went and found them, and they rescued them. And then they would bring them to these little airfields tucked in the middle of nowhere that, that only they knew where they were. And they would fly them back out of Yugoslavia. 500 airmen rescued in the course of this operation. You know, these Yugoslavs, these, these people were not heroes. They weren't highly trained. They weren't specialists from out of town or experts in their field. They just knew their land. They just knew their villages. They just knew what was going on in their part of the world. And God said, I can use you. We know our part of the world. We know our jobs. We know our families. We know our community. God may not be calling us to go to Canada. What a God-forsaken place that is. God may not be calling us there, but he's calling us to Tecumseh. We know this part of the world better than anyone, and we can save souls here. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the ministry that we have, that you have called us to this place. Lord, I pray that, that people would be called to other places. And you know, we do missions trips and we have missions presentations partly because we want people to go around the world. But Lord, we know that for most of us, we have been called here. Lord, we pray that you would use us. We know the territory. We know the terrain. We know the problems. We know the people. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to save some. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.